Good morning, everyone. It's still a bit. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. <laughs> I was beginning to doubt the quality of our coffee. Right? <laughs> but thanks for uh, joining us. I'm uh, Brahima Kulibali, the uh, senior fellow at Brookings and the director of the uh, Africa program. Uh, this uh, is a really important event, we think, on using uh, extractive industry data to strengthen governance in natural resource sectors in Africa. And we are very pleased to uh, partner for this event with uh, Oxfam and NRGI and uh, public, uh, Publish What You Pay. Uh, these are organizations that are well known uh, with track record of uh, commitment to better natural resource management. Uh, for Africa, uh, we see really uh, from our vantage point two main areas in which natural resource sector could be leveraged better to contribute to uh, sustainably improve living standards but has fallen short. Uh, the first area is it as a vital source of uh, resources for financing sustainable development uh, goals and agendas in general, right? Because there's this uh, shortage of uh, sustainable financing, and we think that uh, strengthening government and natural resources can mobilize additional revenues for Africa to be able to finance its uh, uh, economic development, particularly in a context where um, the, the overseas development assistance outlook is uh, increasingly uncertain. Um, yet, as uh, NRGI uh, reported, uh, Africa and African countries, you no know, African country has a good rating in natural resource governance, and only Ghana and Botswana have satisfactory ratings. All other countries have weak or poor ratings. And seven of the world's uh, bottom ten performers with failing governance uh, scores are in Africa. So we've got to change that. The, encouragingly, we have seen some uh, welcome progress on the continent uh, with countries including Ghana uh, and Guinea stepping up efforts to strengthen governance uh, in their countries. And we were uh, quite honored to have uh, last, uh, last month the president of Guinea, Alpha Conde, um, who kind of shared with us the, uh, the experience of uh, Guinea and the reform they've undertaken and uh, what sort of uh, early payoffs they've been seeing. And we have with us the ambassador from Guinea, who you would also hear from uh, later on. And the second area for us has been how do we design policies for natural resource management in a way that they aligned much better with uh, overall structural transformation uh, agendas and is able to contribute more to job creation and poverty uh, alleviation. Uh, so we've been undertaking some work through our colleague John Page and uh, other experts and they are completing a project looking precisely at uh, recent discoveries in oil and gas in Ghana, Mozambique, Tanzania, Uganda, and Zambia, exploring how to avoid policy mistakes of the past so that the discoveries can contribute uh, better to structural transformation. Uh, it's going to be published in a book called Mining for Change, and that's going to come in January 2020. So that will be a new year, uh, good reading. Um, but in both areas, whether finance or whether uh, making it work better for structural transformation, uh, data is central uh, to this process. Uh, and it's difficult really to have uh, good governance, strengthen it, unless you really have the data you need uh, to proceed. Um, so to kind of put, um, this kind of puts in context a bit today's event. And uh, Danny, when he comes to give his brief remark, will give a bit more color, color to this. So we're proceeding with two panels separated by, uh, by, by a brick. And uh, the first panel will feature a case example of how better data contributed to broader policy change efforts. And uh, the second panel will be a panel of experts who would come and provide their views on emerging lessons and on future direction for transparency and uh, accountability. So, so with that, Danny, if you could uh, join the podium to give your remarks. Thank you. Very important. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, cool. I am. I'm going to do something very surprising for myself and and also for for our organization, given the flow and the request for for these panels. And it's not to show 45 slides. In fact, not to show show any in this uh, in this frame, framing remarks. Even though it is 
We're all here because what unites us is the power of data for transformation, for, for action, for fighting inequality and strengthening accountability. And I usually prefer to let the data talk rather than being a talking head myself. But uh, let me <coughs> present then some, a little bit of evidence, if even it's in, in words, and help us per request give a few framing reflections for the morning today. Um, I want to thank first and say what a great pleasure it is to be part of this collaborative event with Brookings and Oxfam and so many other partners and friends from many other countries which are present here. Let me also thank very much in this context Publish What You Pay, another of our great partners, Resources for Development, Global Witness, Emerging Markets Mar Investors Alliance, the Ford Foundation, and Ambassador Kofari and Samia from Guinea, who I've known for a long time. In fact, this is part of a continuous lear learning about the impact of data in natural resources. Uh, since us here today, this morning, follows the learning lab that was convened by Oxfam Publish What You Pay and us at NRGI with nearly 30 <coughs> people from 16 countries coming together to sh share challenges and successes. There were great case cases presented during the past two days, such as in Peru, the Organización Co Cooperación with Grupo de Justicia, this, Justicia Fiscal, connecting their tax analysis with local spending and policy change. And then in Nigeria, publisher who you pay, working with Policy Alert, using project-level data published under mandatory disclosure regulations in the EU and Canada. And there were many others, and some will be featured this morning. In our own organization, with partners who have also had many telling evidence-based case studies, resulting in concrete progress, such in Myanmar, Ghana, Nigeria, other countries in Africa, and the Middle East, <clears throat> so I think we have a rich base for discussion today. In my brief time, in the next few minutes, uh, as per request in helping frame the discussion, I'd like to put forth a quartet of salient issues where in most of them, successes and gains have taken place, but where we also need to go to the next stage together. So let me, <coughs> means, <coughs> let me get straight to the four, to the quartet. First, is about transparency and data. Transparency means more disclosure and data. And thanks to the, the movement where we've all been part of this together for quite some time, with so many here, showcasing the, the power of partnership, significant gains have been attained. Let's be a, a clear about, and there is a cause for celebration. Specifically, thanks to the mandatory disclosure laws in the EU, EU, EU in the UK and Canada, companies from so many corners of the world report over $800 billion in payments by now. For Africa alone, this is close to $120 billion, I reported. So this is not small change. Further, thanks to EITI, <coughs> in addition to these mandatory payment disclosures, complementing that, now the, these disclosures are also taking place in addition to payments for contracts, for beneficial owners, and incipiently for commodity traders. But there are a couple of major challenges ahead still. First is the implementation gap, taking what has been agreed and approved all the way to real concrete execution in the field, on the ground, so that disclosures and open data is much fuller. And we, <coughs> this is something that we have codified, the implementation gap, the difference between what's in the law, what's in the books, and what's in practice in the resource governance index in detail. And I'm not, as I said, I'm not going to show the data, but uh, trust us, and I know that many, with many of you, we have worked on, on that. So that's one of the challenges on the transparency and the different. Second, there are remaining areas of particular opacity which need major attention now, such as the whole issue of looking into the service providers <coughs> or so-called subcontractors. Remember the major case in Latin America starting in Brazil with Odebrecht, the construction company, to a contractor to Petrobras. Um, and also for the transparency and disclosure are needed with respect to commodity traders and state-owned enterprises and extractives, as well as beginning to get more data on the cost structure of industry projects, cost accounting, where there's still a lot of opacity. Since transparency 
alone is not enough. We need to move to the second challenge, keeping in mind that disclosures without accountability in terms of data becomes zombie data. So that leads to the second point, which is the paramount importance of civic freedoms, voice, and accountability, the ability of civil society to operate <laughs> freely in this environment and media freedoms. As shown in, in the data-driven resource governance index, again, where voice and accountability, in countries where voice and accountability is lacking, Governance and transparency in natural resources is failing, and vice versa. Those are the successes. We all know that civic space is closing in a number of countries, and we need to redouble our efforts to protect it. But not all is bleak. We have had successes showing that progress can take place, such as introducing major protections and safeguards for civil society in EITI. And the data that we have shows that it has concretely helped in a number of countries already. This, in turn, matters for the third very large issue I want to put forth and challenge we should address next, namely high-level corruption and state capture in resource-rich countries. Uh, without voice and accountability and transparency, no prospects of addressing corruption and state capture, as it can be shown also in the data analysis. The particular issue of state capture relates to major inequality in political influence, where the powerful few capture the rules of the game for their private benefit, unduly influencing the laws, the licensing regulations, the policies, and the contracting and procurement systems. More data and policy analysis and extractives on this topic needs further attention in the next stage, which is part of our ambition in our new strategy. This leads me to the fourth and last dimension and pending challenge, namely the need to contribute together to the energy transition, but for real, <coughs> not rhetoric. And again, <coughs> with data and rigorous analysis, where we ought to address the main distortions in the extractive sector, which we know so much about, we have so much data, which those distortions which are slowing down the energy transition and the economic diversification in the countries where we work. And we also need to factor in rigorously the climate change and environmental cost and considerations into our models, into our calculations, into our, our projections that we share with our partners regarding investment projects in extractive, helping lessen the likelihood of not just stranded assets for countries, but stranded countries in terms of the, the oil, the gas, and the mining that they have under the ground. So those were the quartet. Let me just end <coughs> on a more personal and humble note about events, <coughs> the, in case I look tired, <coughs> that keep me awake at night right now. And this is about the violence and the social discontent that <coughs> has erupted in my own country. One considered until just a few days ago such a success story in so many dimensions, and rightly so in some respects. The country's chief in Chile geographically is far from Africa. Its per capita income in PPP terms is $23,000, but it exhibits the highest income inequality among OECD countries. Yes, we are a member of OECD, but also about the highest level of inequality in Latin America, and an equal, <coughs> which is an unequal continent to begin with. Educational attainments are also highly unequal. <coughs> Those without education don't have jobs or gainful employment. This income and education inequality links again to one of the key areas I just mentioned, namely the undue unequal influence by the elites. Uh, indeed, there are dimensions of capture in my own country as, uh, as well, which need to be addressed. So. To end, the focus of this morning is obviously on Africa, but events in Chile, here in the U.S., in the U.K., in Lebanon, in Hong Kong, among others, remind us of the fragility of gains that have been achieved and of the homework ahead, which is a global challenge. So we should benefit from this evidence-driven event today with expertise and case studies that you bring for Africa, but also beyond, more globally. So without further ado, <coughs> let me invite our partner from Oxfam, as well as <coughs> our friend, 
and compatriot, Isabel Monilla, who will moderate the first panel featuring case studies on how data has contributed to policy change. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.